Newstar passed through a $100 million loss in 2019, but I'm going to tell you why that should have been a $200 million gain. Let's get started. Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott, and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing New Star stock by analyzing their financial ratios and dissecting their financial statements so we can determine if the stock is a buy or a sell. New Star is an oil and gas midstream company. Midstream refers to points in the oil production process that falls between upstream and downstream. Midstream activities include the storage, processing, and transportation of petroleum. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, market cap $1.2 billion. They're trading at 1076 a share. To get shares outstanding, it's market cap divided by stock price, that's $109 million. Let's look at the financials. Free cash flow is how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows, then you discount that number back to today's value. And that's what we're doing in this video today. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. And this company has positive free cash flow in three of the four years. They have negative in 2019. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. They also have positive net income in three of the four years, except in 2019. We'll look at the financials in a little bit to see why. Their revenue grows 3% in 2017, 8% in 2018, but dropped 31% in 2019, similar to most oil and gas midstream companies. Their profit margins are a little low. I like to see above 20%. Of course, it's negative in 2019, but in other years, it's between 8 and 10%. Net profit margin is net income divided by revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. In 2018, they converted 10% of their revenue into profit, which means 90% went towards expenses. Let's look at the financial statements. This is the income statement. The top line is revenue. Below that is cost of revenue. This is how much money the company spent in order to generate the revenue. The expenses are the payroll for the workers working on the front lines, also the cost of the factories and cost of materials. And then the gross profit is revenue minus cost of revenue. Operating expenses are expenses that are related to the business but not in making the actual products, like payroll for accounting or payroll for HR. You also have depreciation and amortization in there. Below that is operating income, and this is a good number to focus on because this number can't usually be manipulated with accounting tricks. Below that, there's a lot of things going on that could really manipulate the numbers. It's also important that the company has positive operating income because if it's negative, they can't really sustain a business that way. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt, and you want to make sure that number is less than operating income. If it's not, that means the company needs to take on more debt to run its day-to-day -day operations. Below that is other. This is when a company generates money or loses money outside of its regular business operations. In 2019, they had negative $105 million of net income, but you can't really tell in Yahoo Finance because it doesn't pick up all the information. Let me show you their actual income statement from their 10K. So this is from the 10K. So you can see in 2019, they had $206 million of income from operations, which is higher than the other years. The reason they had negative net income was this negative $312 million, and I'll show you what that is. In 2019, they sold part of their operations. So this loss was due to a goodwill impairment. So since they sold this company, the value on the balance sheet was more than the amount of money they received when they sold the company, which means they had to pass through a loss onto the income statement. If they sold this operation for more than what it was worth on the balance sheet, they would have passed through a gain on the income statement. This is a non-cash item because they acquired the business years ago. They're just passing through the loss onto the income statement. I'll show you on a statement of cash flows of 336 million. So on the 2019 statement of cash flows, operating cash flows on top, that's 508 million. To calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, which was negative 105 million, and then you adjust for the non-cash items. The $336 million impairment is right here, so they have to add it back to net income. Also, they have to add back depreciation and amortization and these other small non-cash items. They also have to adjust for working capital. So their operating cash flow was $508 million, even though net income was negative. 
So always look at operating cash flow. That's a much better indicator than net income. And the way you calculate free cash flow, it's operating cash flow minus capital expenditures. And that's why they're negative in 2019. But the reason they're negative is because they invested so much into their business. CapEx was so high that year, 546 million. It wasn't because they were losing money, it was just because they were investing back into their business. CapEx are investments in property, plant, and equipment. The entire amount is recorded in the cash flow for investing section in the year the asset was purchased. CapEx is capitalized, which means it is recorded as an asset on the balance sheet. It is depreciated over its useful life, so each year, Part of the value of the asset is deducted from the balance sheet and passed through onto the income statement as an expense, so it brings down your net income. CapEx is generally considered a positive thing since the company is investing in their operation to grow it. When analyzing CapEx, you should consider two factors. Will this item provide the company with a good return on investment? And what is the opportunity cost? Meaning, would the company be better off if the cash was used for something else? Their financials look pretty strong. They have good free cash flow in three of the four years. They seem to be operating a solid business. Let's look at a capital structure. $3.4 billion of debt, $2.4 billion of equity. The interest rate they pay in their debt is 5.4%. And to get the cost of debt is interest rate times one minus the effective tax rate. So cost of debt is 5.11%. The weight of debt is 59%, which means they have 41% equity cost of equity is 21.29%. And to get cost of equity, we use a capital asset pricing model. Part of the CAPM model is the beta. That's how volatile the stock is. And they have a really volatile stock. They have a beta of 2.47. So if the S&P 500 goes up 1%, this stock should go up about 2.5%. And the WAC is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. And that's the discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 590 million. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $588 million. We divide that by 109 million shares. We get a calculated stock price of 538. They're trading at 1076, so they're trading at a 100% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street's a lot higher than me. They're at 932 a share, so they're saying the stock is overvalued, just not as much as me. Simply Wall Street gets its value from the average analyst estimate. Let's see where the stock has been trading the past few years. So the stock was trading over $50 a share, and it's come down quite a bit. So it could be a good value if you have faith in this company and this industry. Let's look at the historical dividends. The dividend was $1.10 for a couple of years. Then they cut it almost in half to 60 cents. They dropped it again to 40 cents. This is probably to be more in line with the stock price. They do have a good dividend yield, 14.32%. And dividend yield is annual dividend payment over stock price. As the stock price goes up, the dividend yield goes down. And as the stock price goes down, the dividend yield goes up. It's good to remember that the financial performance of a company is not always correlated to the stock price. It can help or hurt the stock price. The only thing that's purely correlated to the stock price is supply and demand of the market. If more people want to buy a stock than sell a stock, the stock price will go up. If more people want to sell a particular stock than buy it, the stock price will go down. The market is forward thinking. They don't usually look towards the past, they look towards the future. So you have to try to understand market sentiment. No one can really predict the stock market in the short run, but in the long run, if you hold stocks of good companies, you should be better off than most investors. Let's look at their financial ratios. Negative PE, the median for the market is 15.8, the average is 17.6. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have negative net income, so they have negative PE. Price of sales is really good. The median is 2.0, the average is 4.6. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. Calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. They're at 0.8, so that means investors are paying 80 cents for $1 of revenue. Price to book is really good also. The median is 2.3, the average is 4.8. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. They're at 0.5, so investors are paying 50 cents for $1 book value. That's an amazing ratio. 
Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on the balance sheet. Pretty good interest coverage ratio. The median is 3.9, the average is 12.8. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They're at 2.1, so they can cover their interest payments. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes, also called operating income on the income statement. Negative ROE because of that big impairment. The median for the market is 12%, the average is 13%. ROE is net income over equity. Of course, they're negative because they have negative net income. Current ratio is really weak. The median is 1.3, the average is 1.8. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. So they cannot cover their current liabilities with their current assets. Current assets are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months, such as cash accounts receivables and inventory. Current liabilities are debts and payables that are due within 12 months, such as current debt and accounts payable. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to similar companies. I've done videos on 36 oil and gas midstream companies, and New Star is right here. If New Star has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So of course they're worse in PE because they're negative with that goodwill impairment. They're doing much better in price to sales and price to book, so that's good. Current ratio, they're doing really poorly. Negative ROE, they're doing a little better in debt. They're a small company, 1.2 billion market cap, averages almost 8 billion. And they do pay a nice dividend, much higher than the average. They're over 14%, the average is under 12%. So to summarize, I have them trading at 100% premium. Their ratios look okay, but their financials look pretty good. Let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. I respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me, receive a custom valuation, or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Every month, I will provide my members with an Excel file to help them better analyze stocks. Thanks for watching.